Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Allison Hurrier, and I head up the textile arts curriculum at uh, the School of Art and Design at Portland State University. For those of you who are um, joining us from outside of the university today, the textile arts curriculum is an elective track in the BFA art practice program that provides an interdisciplinary approach to the study of clothing and textiles. We offer courses in weaving, surface design, sewn construction, dress history that encourage students to develop portfolios for a variety of applications in apparel, costume, textiles, and contemporary art. This is one of four events that we're going to be hosting this term that brings in outside perspectives to supplement our current course offerings. And we hope that you can join us again next Wednesday, uh, April 28th at 1230 for Rhonda P. Hill. Uh, Rhonda is going to be with us discussing EDGE, an international platform for advancing emerging designers who are intersecting art with fashion while engaging in environmental and ethical consciousness. Um, I'll share links to the program um, for any uh, guests uh, or students that want to know more about these events or our course offerings. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are joining you today from Portland State University, which is located near the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon in Multnomah County, Oregon. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous tribes of the Columbia River Valley. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. And remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Today, it is my great pleasure to welcome Gabe Duggan. Gabe's practice combines um, techniques of traditional fiber work to push material boundaries, establishing and challenging repetitive systems of tensions and balance. Building from experience and education in fine art, fashion, and textiles, their work has been supported by the NC Arts Council and Art on the Atlanta Beltline. Their work has also been featured in ex exhibitions at SECCA, Flanders, Lump, Anchor Light, Aramont, and Garrison Hahn. Duggan has taught at numerous institutions, including the University of North Texas, Georgia State University, North Carolina State University, Aramont School of the Arts and Crafts, and Penland School of Craft, and they are currently an assistant professor of East Carolina University. Gabe, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Yeah, I okay. also oh, I also just want to recognize um, as I as I stop sharing here, um, Shelly uh, Sokolowski, who we are very fortunate to have teaching our digital weaving course this term. Um, Shelly is going to be helping facilitate today's discussion. We really do want it to be an open dialogue, so feel free to type questions or comments in the chat and use the raise hand function as we go, and we'll work to respond to the um, questions and comments when there's a pause in the presentation. And we'll also save some time at the end. So thank you for everyone to everyone for spending time with us today. And Gabe, I will let you take it away from here. Thanks. All right, you can, you can all hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Cool going to share my screen. We're going to see what happens with that. Might take a second. I'll try it this way. All right. So you should all see a little bit of text on my screen right now. Yeah. And just give me a shout if something's not really working right or if you can't hear me. Um, it's great to meet you all, you know, even this way. And thanks so much for coming. Uh, just for the reference, I'm looking at a fly right now that um, might interrupt me later. <laughs> but anyway, I am I'm, I'm talking to you on Tuscarora land in eastern North Carolina, so east coast. It's just after 7 p.m. here. The sun is still out. It's really nice, uh, but we'll get into that. So I wanted to open up with this uh, quote. If you haven't checked out this book, it just came out like in the last year, last few months, Glitch Manifesto. This is uh, some citations here, some references that you can look into. And I'm not going to talk about specifically all of these, but these might be kind of interesting. I make some points about it in other presentations that relate to what we're talking about today. So um, has anybody seen this book or have this book yet, Glitch Feminism Manifesto? Oh my gosh. So um, I kind of just want to take you over to their site now. Um, Legacy Russell uh, is a Black feminist queer scholar. Um, this is the book. Go ahead and grab it. Um, it's pretty cool talking about memes. And every every chapter is about you know, glitch refuses, glitch is fluid, like, oh, it's great stuff. So to open the book, it begins to glitch is to embrace malfunction, 
to embrace malfunction is in and of itself an expression that starts with no. All right, so this is really important to me. You'll see a little traces of it here and there, but um, anyway, I'm gonna start from the back and get all the way up to the top. Um, this is some earlier work. I ended up getting some fashion degrees in undergrad. It, it's been a long path and it takes many roads to get wherever you're headed. Just keep following your interests. I'm gonna keep in mind that you folks are all attached to some kind of program. You're on some kind of track probably for a degree. Uh, keep going with whatever it is calling to you. If you end up off your path, it will find you, it will haunt you down. Um, if you end up working waitress jobs or something for a couple of years, it, it will find you, art will track you down. Um, anyway, so I ended up with these fashion degrees because something, and I never grew up around that F word, that's for sure. But one thing that I always did, I, you know, I probably learned how to weld or something before even sewing, but I learned how to sew a long time ago when I was a kid and I was messing with thrift store clothes. And so I knew that there was something powerful about garments. Um, and that was the one thing that I could work with was, you know, addressing the body. And I, I believe that you're all talking about that a lot in your program, which is exciting. And I want to talk more and more about that, but we won't necessarily today. Uh, this is a small collection or just excerpts from a collection that I started doing with knitwear. I did some knitwear stuff. I'm not going to go into this. It's the only two slides, but this is after grad school when I figured out how to build cloth itself. The whole reason I got fashion degrees is because I wanted to do something that I knew how to do and I wanted to get a job and I probably should have just been in some kind of interdisciplinary sculpture program, but you know, jobs or whatever. And thankfully, I didn't really go too far working in the fashion industry. Um, the calling is strong, right? You, you keep going after what's your interest. Um, sorry, this one's pixelated. It took me a while to track down some of these images. This is my graduate thesis. So by the time I got through grad school, I was trying to make sense of all of this. Like the body is important. I like these techniques. I'm exploring obviously like knitwear and things from the fiber up. This one piece in the center here is a single piece and it's hand spun and this seam, it has this one seam that twists around the body because it's over spun. I don't know if you do any spinning, but I really, in, in grad school for me, it was all about knowing everything. I wanted to know everything about this material that we work with and live in and that really runs our world economy, right? Fiber is important, fashion is important. So these are, this is a spectrum of eight different fiber objects that go on the body. This is my thesis. I won't spend too much time on this. This big piece here is I think 26 alpacas. Um, I was messing around with how to present these. And this is actually in a museum show. They requested that they be presented this way, but for my defense and how I prefer and, and intend them to actually be presented is all folded up. So you actually experience them as fiber objects. And the only ways that you experience these in reference to the body is through this projection. It's almost like a hologram of a model taking these, putting these on and taking them off, right? So I wanted to think about control over being seen, like the experience of the wearer versus the experience of the viewer. Um, yeah, anyway, and also thinking about the spectrum of raw to refined, high technology to like quote primitive. Um, and so this is where I really started messing around with um, getting rid of tools and thinking about how we, what we define technology as. So for myself, I think of technology as something, it's anything between the idea, the concept, the thought, the feeling, and the material. So that means it includes my whole body, right? It, it includes my hands, that's the tool, that's the technology. That also means it includes memories. Uh, if I have certain uh, triggers or glitches of my own, right? That's all part of this system. Um, so pretty soon after grad school, and actually I started testing this out in grad school, but didn't know how to really go forward with it. Um, I was doing a lot of installation work. So working off of building off these really strong fiber technic uh, traditions. Um, so basically this front piece here is machine knit with these holes, everything's structurally sound. I'm doing a lot of holes. So you can see and imagine the glitches, right? Structurally sound holes. I want things to, I'm very, controlled and controlling, but definitely want to like talk about things falling apart. And I want to find things that are at that balance, that tipping point of, are they falling apart or coming together? Are they barely in between either? Uh, so this is a, an installation I did up at Governor's Island. And um, 
this webby stuff in the background that's all back and forth geometrically that's technically a basic crochet which is also what the alpaca piece is and that's something i've been doing my whole life without tools right um not even a hook or anything just the body so and what i was thinking about too is accessibility i, I don't want to be hinged to a machine which is you're going to see the importance of that i was specifically thinking about that with digital weaving these strands what i like here is that the the forward and backwards, the positive and negative space change places as you move through the space. It's hard to tell um, what's forward or backwards. It's kind of disorienting. This is more of this piece. And these are parts of the balcony that I brought into the room. This is another piece that I did later on at the same um, with the same people that do this kind of DIY art fair at Governor's Island. There's all sorts of stuff going on on the island right now. Um, Lots of good art stuff to check out. Definitely apply to things if you can. Uh, this is just outside of Manhattan. You have to get to it by ferry. It's part of New York, the city. Um, so coming back into like where I was when I left art school as undergrad before I went on this fashion thing, I started bringing in other uh, materials, right? Rocks, glass, um, this is roofing tar, things balance precariously, um, printing things up uh, based on the, access to the printer that you have um working with what's in front of you and not trying to have like a a big honking beautiful print just diying things doing a xerox copy if that's what works if that's what you have access to so balancing and plotting these all in space almost like a graphing calculator um roofing tar roofing tar a little snake knit here um keep going and this is actually this this is uh, a big old vintage photo of somebody that is in a chair reading popular science and there's this lamp that's glowing. So I was thinking about the impact of um, the psyche on the body uh, and how things that we feel and are maybe spiritual or uh, psychological are actually, they impact science, right? They come, it's all connected and it becomes science. Uh, this is another installation. So I kept going and going with installations. And so we're gonna move forward through installations for a little bit. Um, and this is one that I did in the summer 2016. So leading up to the presidential election, feeling like everything was getting more tense, feeling like everybody was arguing, but not even speaking the same language. Uh, I made these rigid uh, steel pieces that I welded and uh, forged um, together. So they're rigid and they're trying to be perfect, but they're actually pretty rough around the edges, right? They're still very hand and globular. And then having the knit pieces that look like they're falling apart, um, but they're structurally sound. And so within this installation are floating magnets. And so this is the true gravity. And um, basically it's, you know, there's all this tension. These magnets are trying to reach and they never can. Whoops, let me get back on this. So installations, installations. Um, I did a self-proposed residency at the Muskox Farm in Alaska. If you don't know about Muskox, you probably do. If you're on the West Coast, you might be more familiar with it. They have a really fancy fiber called Kivute. Um, they have a great history. Muskox is the inappropriate misnomer for them. We should call them Umimak is a better name. Umimak is uh, the native word that means bearded one. Muskox is a misnomer because they don't have musk glands and they're not oxen. Um, so anyway. I asked them to re reserve all this uh, bailing twine for me from the winter and I made this huge installation and this is all just crochet uh, outdoors and it was this interactive piece that they they kept up throughout the summer for their tourists to I had a prompt and it was a community call and response kind of thing. So thinking about how we support each other through tough times like winter. Um, and almost every time I do an installation like this where people respond there's always somebody <laughs> there's always stuff about health like people are like, can we please get some health care? So um, basically like, and I have this label as experimental. In 2015, I kind of cracked open a few different holes or like I, I pushed right through these doorways. So when I was working on these installations, like so back in 2014, I remember thinking, oh gosh, there's this tension here. I can almost hear it. I, I can feel it. I should be miking this stuff. I should play this like an instrument. What if I go outside, blah, blah, blah. So in 2015, I started taking it outside. Um, and uh, am I doing okay with pace? Like, is it okay for me to just keep plowing forward like this? 
I know we're trying to do like, no, um, yeah, you're great. You're great. Um, if anyone has any questions though, just feel free to, to type them into the chat or comments. Yeah. And I can't even see the chat. So I'll let you all jump in if it is good. We'll do. Um, so thanks. Uh, so still 2015, um, went outside with the balancing twine, mic'd up the, the installation for this artist in residency that I, this re residency that I did at, um, an independent film festival. And we, this is me and Nick Jenkins. He's a percussionist and an independent musician. And we, con we added contact microphones to my piece. We played it. It sounded like Jurassic Park. It was really big and boomy and doomy. It was pretty cool. Um, and I think I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit, but um, there's still more to go. So in 2015, I'm still just expanding, expanding. And I guess this is more in 2016. I started collaborating, doing more with music. This is a collaboration I did with Neil Pruitt, who primarily works with like new media and video. And so I created this like trilogy, um, including the spinster type here. Uh, and I also kept going with music. Um, so still experimenting. I thought there was another thing I was going to put from 2015, but I guess this is it. Um, more work outside happened in 2015 too. Uh, here, I so as you can see, I'm doing a lot of abstract things and they're not saying a lot very clearly. So I ended up just starting this thing that I, I just call cheers because it's rhythm based and then it's just my vocals. So playing a basic drum or even working with a small drum machine where I'm actually saying firm words, like actual words, but then I'm still being kind of obscure with them too. Um, but it's really stripped down stuff and then I'll perform these sometimes. So I've done this on and off for the last few years. Um, more experimental stuff like an in interdisciplinary, I started messing around with some scientists. I got um, this residency where I got to work in an ant lab. Uh, this is me talking with the scientists. We, we did this whole um, interview together and we did like a science cafe where the public came and asked questions and we did an open studio, open lab. And I don't think I have the picture here, but basically I had my studio in his lab at, at his lab bench and I installed this piece and we dug out this uh, ant nest that's this one is about nine feet tall and um you probably have seen these and he he worked in florida with the guy who you'll see on youtube doing this all the time casting these nests out of something like aluminum or a quick like low temperature metal we cast it in dental plaster because that's the material that they use in the labs to study these ants and so um this this artist the scientist uh Adrian Allen Smith is just, he's fabulous. He's interested in citizen science and he's really interested in engaging and making science accessible. Um, and so one of the things he was studying is ant architecture and he knows all this really interesting stuff about their pheromones. But I looked around the lab and I said, okay, you're studying the subject, you're studying these animals, these creatures, these beings, but you're studying them in the realm of um, some kind of imported sand this dental plaster, these medical plastic and latex tubes. How, how are you, how is that unbought? You know what I mean? Like, how are you gonna get real results in that weird environment? So I was thinking about those materials and the impact that that has on studies. Um, other things that I have done with my installations and keeping expanding, I ran, I pumped water, you can see the pump here all the way to the top so this is kind of like an automated painting machine except that it's with rust and so it's the piece is kind of eating itself right it's corroding itself um the water is running down it there are pieces of paper and silk here that would naturally be dyed or stained um, from this rust in this process it runs down to the basin and gets fed back up into it here's another weird view of it this is actually a chunk of a fluorescent light fixture um, and here's a nice close up. I, I like working with text and I like pushing at legibility. This is something that is just supposed to simulate text but not be text. So I've also used this piece as part of a performance. Uh, I asked people to give me um, a response to times that they have uh, had a misogynist thought or misogynist action not done to them but that they've done or had or felt themselves. So um, I took those responses and they were all anonymous and I ended up kind of, I don't know, 
performing them over a drum machine. It's kind of interesting. It's pretty cool and groovy and weird. Um, and so when I would read those out loud, I kind of, I released those, that burden uh, open to the public, um, even though it was anonymous. And then my friend Jax wrapped them around rocks, these little bits of paper and sunk them in the water so they could get freed up and free floated and erased. Um, other things that I've done, so still thinking about sound, contact mics on two looms. So we took two looms uh, and put them side by side, like facing each other and use them to create attention. And this is a collaboration I did with my friend, Abby Sherrill, who's also an, a fiber-based artist or educator. And um, these doctor students at the music school in, at UNT, which is a really phenomenal kind of school. So anyway, that was a pretty cool performance we did. Again, it was pretty doomy, but it was beautiful because we actually brought in, the, because the, they work in music, they brought in all these interesting little parts to play on the looms. And, we used our loom knowledge and they use their music sound knowledge. All right, so let's talk about digital weaving. Um, when I, this is not the first thing that I wove on a digital loom, but when I first started weaving on a digital loom, I saw what was happening from my instructors and that their work, like one of their works was like, for, it was primarily digital weaving. And I was like, I don't wanna have to be chained to an institution because of the equipment. And that's, that's, that was like at least 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And it's still kind of the same story. Like there's, there's only a few of these looms that are out independent of a university or a similar huge institution. So um, that's why I started, I kept thinking about like working with just my body. But anyway, um, this is a piece that I've done. This is a file that I've, I've used over and over again. This is the depths of Lake Erie. It's called bathymetry, you know, like topography. The depths of Lake Erie, which is where I'm from, um, grew up on Lake Erie a lot. And this is a traditional coverlet. So you can see I've expanded, I've taken this digital file. I'll go in here. Oh, I replaced it incorrectly. Let me just zoom in here. So you can see this motif and this is gonna be pretty noisy. Hopefully you can follow my cursor. The motif in the center here with this round part is like a little crosshairs kind of God's eye thing. And then you can see it here again and again and again. And so it trickles all the way out to like here is where it is on the outer ridge. So basically I'm kind of doing like a, I'm doing kind of like an inside joke with weaving where I'm taking a four or an eight bit system traditional pattern. And then I'm multiplying it times a decimal system like 10% and I'm dropping it 10% in size. So I'm taking the traditional and then I'm fusing it with this digital. So those are just different numerical systems that they happen to like. But anyway, this is a traditional coverlet. It's done in the traditions of cotton with wool and overshot and all this very basic technical stuff that is specific and interesting and good. Um, and it has, if you flip it, it's the inverse pretty much, black on white, white on black. All right, let me make sure I'm fitted on here again. So. That would be a detail shot, but that is up on my website, which hasn't been updated in forever, but you can find more on that if you want. Um, so other things I've been thinking with digital weaving is not just making something that's contained and controlled and good, but what if we start letting it fall apart, which a lot of artists have been doing, which I think is great. Um, a lot of us have a lot of really loopy warps hanging off things right now. Um, so this is me thinking about the dualities inside ourselves as an artist, like the, the double-edged sword of either you're silencing yourself or you're, you're exploiting yourself. Like how much do we decide what, what of our story to tell? Um, so this is silencing my silencing, exploiting my exploitation, and they're joined. It's, the same, it's two sides of the same coin. They're fused together. It's a diptych that is, you know, inextricable. Um, hey, Dave. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of like um, two sides of the coin, or I think they're the same cloth, but Gigi has a question in the chat related oh, to the Lake Wise piece prior. Mm -hmm. um, and Gigi says, are both the black and white parts in overshot or just the white? And I don't know, Gigi, if you mean the two different sides or if you're uh, referring to the black sort of line work that's running mm -hmm. over the top of the overshot. 
Yeah, I'm talking about like the, it seems very obvious that like the negative space is an overshot, but then like the black line work part, I'm not really understanding the structure. Yeah, I, I got you. Um, let me hop this forward. Can you see this preview image? Yeah. Okay, so stuff like this might help you. There's big floats of, and what I did is I didn't do like a solid thick wool because it's not hard enough. Why not make it harder? Um, I did, it was like 8,000 passes per two panels. Um, this is, I took like two or three strands of a thinner wool that I had because, you know, I'm not going to waste things. And I put those together and I didn't even apply them. So it was a, a nightmare for tension. Does that answer this? Hopefully. I'll see what else we have for this. Maybe I'm thinking about like your digital process for this. Like when you're ah. looking at the different layers of the black and white in the digital file. I'm like, like in terms of a technical question. Oh, I, I think I know what you mean. Want, but I, I, yeah, I was just gonna like, say like is it like is it maybe satin like that you use to for the black areas like a satin basically yeah I came up with like a weird like um yes it's completely different it's not like the inverted overshot it's I did do a unique I came up with some kind of like bricked out satin stitch basically not stitch but you know yeah good question that makes sense or it makes sense now I know what you're asking. Did I did I answer it okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's cool to know what, where the crowd's at. Um, yeah, Can I ask definitely. one question before you go on? I'm gonna, I wanna go back to the music pieces. I'm curious to hear from you how you, what inspired you to begin to connect music to the threads? And I think you said something about um, putting some sort of a sonic device up against some of the tense threads, is that how you were um, treating the music or was it more about the concept of rhythm or can you speak a little bit about the music and its relationship to the textile crochet work? Yeah, um, it definitely is tension, which, you know, this is the most it can be. It's like so direct, um, but it definitely was, we'll go way the heck back. Um, it was, I remember just installing this and being like, Oh, like when I was do working on these right here, these strands. I mean, like, this is a whole universe. I need to feel all of this. And sound has been on my mind, you know, forever. And it just, it's wild. Like it just, it just takes so long to get to some things in life. But if you don't give up or, or just listen when it comes back, you know, um, and try to keep like if it if you get to have a return visit from these ideas get it grab it you know it's and that's definitely like when we get to water um which i've been working on more and more now it's a big part of it too hopefully i answered that question okay it really was about the materials um yeah it's just being in there with the materials yeah yeah mm -hmm. and then this stuff is more about like image which definitely plays into my digital weaving especially like using like selfie screenshot kind of stuff it's like thinking about cindy sherman breaking it like fragmenting it um performing in this femme body and stuff um okay yeah so digital weaving um something that i'm interested in with these digital looms is that you can literally throw a wrench in them this is if you look at the cover of art in america there's a really cool work on there um and there's a lot of, you'll see a lot of digital tapestries going around. I'm sure that you've noticed them. Um, what's, what's interesting to me is that with the TC1, TC2, and then there's like another couple other weird, well, other types out there that do the same thing, is that it's, it's still hand controlled, right? So I can guide the machine through its own what would not otherwise be its own destruction. If I sent out a file to get industrially woven or on another digital machine, if the machine is doing it for me, there's a lot that I can, you know, I can do more because I'm in there. I'm in the guts of the machine. I am the guts of the machine. So this is a piece that I did. Um, I don't even know, it feels like it stands out, but I think it's important in its own lineage or something. I don't even know if I like it or not, but um, 
there's, <laughs> I do, I, I like it for what it is, but I don't know how it fits in the other things. But basically this is a piece that's 100% cotton and in North Carolina cotton super important. Um, and the reason that I think that this piece is interesting is because I've taken uh, the digital file has text from the law. There's a North Carolina law. It's actually across the several Southern states that says, um, and it's part of the Bull, Bull Weevil Eradication Act of 1973 or something. And it says that you have to register your crop with the state. And if you don't, um, if you don't spray the recommended or the required amount of pesticides, and you're, you know, growing it organically or something, you have to have your crop inspected. And if the people, if the state finds something wrong with your crop, they have the right to burn and destroy your crop. So, you know, we think about like weed. Um, I don't know, there's so many other types of plants that are controlled, which is already just kind of like, why are we trying to legalize, like, why is this an issue? And Monsanto issues as well. Like it's, why are these laws? And so, and it's because of like over, like whatever, um, monocrop, uh, agriculture and things like that. And of course, all, all sorts of other things. But um, anyway, my point here is that this is like undocumented cotton that I've grown. And so there's industrial cotton in here, which you can see tucked up in here in a twill. This is a pretty yellow photo. It's a little dark. But this is an industrial mercerized gorgeous cotton that's donated from Cotton Incorporated, which is this, you know, great also government subsidized nonprofit kind of thing, or it's part of it's part of North Carolina. It's really important. I don't know, fabric of our lives. That's them. Um, so they donated some of this, and then this is stuff that I've actually grown, and I've shoved chunks of my baby plants in there. And so this is actually brown cotton. You can do a whole semester or twelve on cotton. Um, this is brown cotton that I've grown, and it's also spun into white cotton that I've grown, and then the chunks of the plant are just in there. And there's all sorts of racialized historic issues with who gets to use white cotton or brown, all sorts of stuff. Um, anyway, so still moving forward with throwing wrenches in this machine. The specific machine that I've been working on is an old TC1 that happened to be neglected for a couple years at a time over the last decade or two because the fiber program that it was a part of was not being supported. And so there's this like state of the art equipment in a state university research one tier one university. Um, and this piece of equipment is just sitting there and nobody knows how to work with it. And so it's just, you know, the machines want to be talked to. Um, and I can't see the chat too, is there? Yeah, I'm watching it, it's all good. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm seeing some people's response or like nodding and stuff anyway. So this happens to be a machine that I'm, you know, I know very well. I'm trying to find out how to tucky folks in a good way. There we go. Um, yeah, this machine is glitching and it's the specific one. And so I've been not just doing it myself when I'm weaving, but I've, I've been watching this machine kind of decay. And um, Let's see, so this is this is a still of like a music video that I may ever finish, I don't know, but this is a still. And basically you can see there's like a ghost echo here. This is a diptych. So I've inverted my file, like I'm weaving the front to the back to the back to the front. Um, and let's see, let me go back here. So you can see, yeah, lots and lots of floats. Um, this machine happens to not be happy on this side, and it's been like that since day one, even at its most high functioning. I'm also thinking about neurodivergence and typicality and, right, how do we call something functional or not dysfunctional, malfunction, like, ugh. anyway. Um, so, and especially like the loom is so great because it's a binary, so, like it's, it just loves itself a binary. So like, this is such fertile ground to be playing with this and just jamming it up. Uh, but anyway, this machine, the specific loom that I'm working with is, <laughs> it started ghosting itself, like echoing itself. This is, the file I sent is here. This is the figure, this hand, hopefully you can see this arm and hand. Here's this head with hair stuff. Here's another hand. Here's another head and hair. I didn't put these here. Like this is the machine talking to me. The machine has decided to take like every eighth or ninth thread and just maybe put it over there. 
so this is this was like my most exciting thing was like oh i have no control but i kind of do um this whole part has just been a hot mess for a while and um now so like i'm like oh this is so great because i am still part of the machine i can walk it through its own demise i can hold its hand as it like kind of crumbles apart and still be getting stuff out of it like still be functioning still be producing I mean, of all the times we're thinking about this now, you know, we're talking about what does it mean to be productive and what is this pressure on us to produce? And especially when everything's just in the screen anyway, it's just so strange. So anyway, um, and I think this might be one of the first times that I'm, you know, I'm just going for it with the screenshot. I'm just like letting the weird ch chunks of my desktop or whatever float around and letting that be in there legibly or not. Um, and yeah, still working with, as you can see, working with uh, actual weaving structures and then working with non-structure. So some of this is intentional, some of this is not. This is me, this is the machine. These giant black floats here is me and my file. This here is the machine doing who knows what. Um, and then the other thing is that like, so, and I'll come back to this actually, remind me, there's like three different levels and I actually should keep an eye on the time. But basically like there's three different levels of um, where you hit this is like file at the loom, wait, file the loom itself at the loom and after the loom, basically. Um, here's another one, more floats. This is just a huge one. This is front and back. This is not a diptych. Um, just a selfie at the beach. This is like a huge honking piece, letting it fall apart, working with the runs that are already in it. These like drop stitch or these dropped heddles um, and it is echoing itself out. Like it, it's just becoming, I'm feeding it some noise, but then it's throwing me back some noise too. And that was like the last huge piece that was ever woven on that loom. And that loom has transported and I'm still talking to it and it's gotten even worse. So I, we'll see. Um, here's the, I wanted to throw this in here. This is the first file where I started playing with this idea of weaving, not weaving. Hey, come back. Okay. so just dropping these black lines in here and it, you know i've called this there are no mistakes this is just my draft um or screenshot of it i have woven this piece back in 2012 but this is the first time i was like okay here are woven structures but then also here are non-woven structures here's just void right the void the black hole this is just zeros um all right so i think this is where, I, where i've titled it Oh, that shouldn't be digital weaving. It should be called, why not just quick print? Yeah, why not just? Um, so again, thinking about access for a while, I didn't have, I wasn't in contact with that loom where I would only touch it like once every year or two. I'm gonna go a little faster. So I started thinking about what do we have access to digital printing? Um, when I was an undergrad, before I knew about fibers and fashion, I was like printing on cloth. It was always about cloth. Um, so this is these are like, cross-section MRI, and then the stitch goes all the way through, they're all connected. More stitching on, or sorry, digital printing on cloth. Um, things I've done with the Lakewise file, this is this, this is those depths of bathymetry of Lake Erie. So I've laser cut that. So instead of just digital weaving it or printing it, I sent it to the laser cutter and the laser cutter gave me these plexiglass rings. And then I installed them this way, still thinking about water a lot. Um, thinking about Lake Erie. And what's funny too, is that this is kind of backwards, right? The depths would be the tiniest and it would be flipped, if that makes sense. So that kind of taught me something when I naturally installed it this way. I was like, oh, this has, that's such a metaphor for how we try to understand things. We look through the surface of the water. We think we're seeing it clearly, but we're seeing upside down. We think we're correct and we stand our ground on it even, right? Um, so more of that little bits more of this, I this I haven't color corrected these yet. So this is like, this is right before pandemic and just doing basically doing more with these rings you can see up here. So likewise files still, so why not just click print? And so this is what I was doing when I was teaching in Texas, didn't have access to this loom, um, but I started printing my digital drafts, my weaving drafts on woven cloth, like manufactured, you know, fabricated cloth. Um, this is cotton. Uh, so you can, you'll probably recognize that kind of draft. Um, little bits here and there. And this is just a, a photo of a, a detail of a piece. So these are all actual layers. So this is like 
grimy printing, like off gas printing, almost like off ink grub on a silk gauze organza. Um, the digital print that I just talked about. And then the printer, of course, you can see is fading out. I have this scan of a weaving that I did with wire on like a floor loom. Um, so starting to just kind of like mess around. And I, I like the details of these works a lot, but I, I'm not fond of them as big pieces like compositionally. So I know that there's something here. I'm gonna keep playing with it. And I also miss drawing a lot. So I'm gonna keep trying to bring that back into it. Anyway, replicas, right? Thinking about replicas a lot. So here's that same selfie at the beach, I think. So it's upside down now. Um, you can see my will, my twill gradient or whatever this draft is. Um, and just layers. And also another reason I started doing these smaller pieces that are wall-based is I wanted to work for, I wanted to make installations, but you can't always just make an installation. Like it takes time and trust and you got to get the space. So um, th I'm thinking about these as installations. They're all just hanging soft from the top. And so they all can like get shifted out of place if they're not installed properly. They just got to hang flat. It's another piece thinking about technology. So this is machine stitched and then, um, Let's see, whereas, and then whereas the hand stitch, where did it go? These are hand stitch. You can see it's replicating a, a machine knit piece that I did here. It's down to my last couple of slides because I know we're getting close to time. Um, but there's, you can see the writing and playing with paper, silk, cotton. This is actual knit back here, so multiple layers. Um, but what I did in this piece is basically the, the hand stitch text is like perfect. And the machine stitch text, I'm like letting it get all jambled up with tension, like letting the tension really pull with the bobbin in a bad way, but still controlling it. So that's something I totally learned from that digital loom, right? Is like how to fall apart without actually falling, how far can we fall apart before falling apart completely? Um, yeah, anyway. So water, I had, first thing I did with water was probably in 2002. I with as a collaboration with two friends in a group assignment in like a foundation class, I put a dead bunny on a rock in the middle of the water, right? And it's, I don't know, whatever, Joseph Boyce, I don't know. So always wanting to do work with water and I wanted to put things over the water. I had ideas for water, like string on water. And back then I just called it string. And I was still trying to print, I was shoving fabric through my printer, right? At home, my mom's or something, Kinko's, which doesn't even exist. But um, I wanted to do this in 2002 and it was 2018, so like almost 20 years later, right? And I finally did this. So here's a kayak for scale. This is something that I did in um, the mountains in North Carolina. It's called obsolescence because I'm thinking about when something, whether it's a culture or an industry gets rendered obsolete, what do we lose? This was on site at a place called Micaville where there was a big surge of industry for mica production and then it just dropped out and so now just like a lot of Appalachia, there's a lot of poverty. Where are the jobs? Um, and then this was also done on the week that I found out that the fibers program that I was working at, it was told to us that they were closing it. So this was just like, I didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden that landed, and I was like, okay, I know what to do now. So I made this piece. Um, and so again, this is just crochet, no tools. I'm the technology, the water, the boat, we're the technology. Um, um, and then this is something that I did last summer and I still need to go through my files to like get the right big overview, but this is working with this DSM Dyneema, this really fancy fiber that's surplus, ind industry surplus. And so the white, what I like is it has this, these like holes in it, but as you can see these inside the holes is black yarn that's also synthetic um, industry surplus. And so you don't see those until you walk under them and then the sky backs it up and you see this pop of a text. Um, and so, and then of course, this is that, this is what it looks like at night, which is really fun. Um, so this is called no one, no one knows. And um, the whole phrase is no one knows or sees the deep and truest. And it's just like this line that I wrote, but it means it also continues on um, the deep and truest no one knows and sees the deep and truest weakness of the oppressor than the oppressed. And so basically that's talking about how like people that survive bad things see just how desperate and weak the oppressor is in those moments. Um, and it's hard to verbalize, but thankfully I saw Paulo Freire 
which is like a really cool radical educator writer, um, has a really good way of saying it. So keep reading books, kids. And I don't call you kids, I'm just saying it that way. So another thing I did last summer, this is the big one. This is real. This was destroyed before it was taken a photo of. And so this is actually like a zombie piece. So again, it's just fun. Somebody came by, I think on a jet ski, some, some bro. Um, it, how, it was how, weird. How are you like, um, oh my God, just when you just said that, I might, I just meant <gasps> somebody just, yeah. okay. But how are you like, um, I mean, you're in the kayak and, and, and it looks like it's just barely hovering over the water. Yes. Yeah. Pretty and much. so, so, oh my God. So is it just so there's no structure that's holding it in place? It's just sort of being, I don't know. I guess the question is, how is it being held in place? Are there, yeah, how are you doing that? Are you just anchoring it to elements that are on the sides of the river, for example? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So this will tell you exactly it. It's, it's six points. So one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven or eight, but all it took was somebody cut, um, and this is this DSM Dyneema stuff, which is, it's stronger than Kevlar. It's, it's used for, it's literally used for ballistic bulletproof materials and also for biomedical implantables. So over here, they had cut like one and two, and basically, I'm gonna do an artist rendering of what it would look like before it was cut, and then after, when it was cut, because basically from this edge of this W, all of this was sunk in the water and swept off to the side in a big tangled mess. And if, how, how many people have crocheted ever or knit? We all know it's one strand. It's one strand, you pull it and it's gone. And that's what this is. Like, so I'm definitely like playing with fire here and you can see it's like zombified, right? As compared to like these nice crisp angles. It's like, it's like shredded and stuff because and I had a, I saved this little baby turtle. It was just, it was, it was totally traumatizing. It was so bad. And so my friend told me not to go back alone just in case, cause this was leading up to the other election we just had, right? This is in the fall of 2020 and, and I'm down here and I'm working alone. And this is like a weird, like I had permission from the, from the parks and rec, but we didn't, we didn't announce it. We didn't put signage up about what this is. So it wasn't in anybody's way, but so whether it was, um, you know, out of spite or curiosity, I don't know. I mean, honestly, it's like, I would have done this myself too. I might've just poked at something just to see what would happen. So it, it was just, it, it was really scary when I, the, the little turtle was a whole thing, but anyway. Um, yeah, it's just, it's piece to piece. I'm thinking about like when I get into something this big and if it's public, my plan for that is definitely education and signage. Um, maybe there's other ways to support it. Like, you know, if there's somebody on staff, that's, I don't know where this site would be, you know, or, um, and of course, you know, I, I'm not trying to get in the business of policing, right? Like this is so weird. So I'm also thinking about like, maybe there's like some kind of steel cable that would float it out where it's out of reach so that people couldn't reach it by land or easily, you know what I mean? Like. But yeah, um, Shelly, it just is like these one, two, three, four, five, six. It's just suspended. Um, wow, it's a great, yeah, great descriptor. Jeez. Yeah, and it's definitely impro improvised. It's not assembled at all until I'm on the site. So it, it's weird. It's not efficient, but that's how I get what I do. Um, and this is the last thing I was going to just show is like, one of the more recent things I did, and this is actually on a TC2 that's high functioning. Like it only has like one dropped out heddle and she's about to put it back in because she's, my colleagues on it. She knows what she's doing. Um, I don't know if you have a grad program or if I should be uh, scooping people up or not, but we have an MFA program. We have a TC2 that is great. And we have the TC1 zombie that I love, um, Frankenloom. So think about coming out here maybe. Um, anyway, this is something I wove on the TC2. You can see it's a black warp it's cotton. It's a different kind of cotton. I don't really like this size and it's lintier, but it's fine. Um, this is another, like, this is just a separate piece. So I, I did this installation. I have to edit these, but you can see this is where I started. Like, so I, I did destruction in the file. You can see the void here, right? No weaving, weaving, non-weaving. This is my screenshot in me and WebEx meetings alone. Um, 
And so void, like feeding destruction to the file. Um, here I'm doing destruction on the loom, like I'm not weaving some of this. So at the loom, I'm choosing to leave this a void, right? That's not a gorgeous salvage, but I don't care right now. Um, and then playing with inverting back and forth with the draft and the screenshot. And then post loom, um, I laser cut it. So that's something I'm going to keep playing with is like messing with these. I don't know if there's one more shot of this. Yeah, so these are like, and then they're suspended in space. So I got to get it to a place where I can actually install this in a nice crisp background. Um, but basically I took the same file. This is a face file, right? You see the edge of like the brow line here um, and laser cut that out and started suspending it in place. And of course it's got that recognizable burn, which I should calibrate my machines, but anyway, um, I'm hoping this summer to do more of that business. Um, so yeah, falling apart, not falling apart, tension. I'm really Gorgeous. curious about this, uh, laser cutting your, your woven fabrics. Is yeah. there like a, do you just put it in there and, and do it? Or is there like a prep process? Do you make it a certain kind of fabric so it'll work well? Like, <sighs> actually, yeah, that's so obvious. Like if it's a synthetic, like you're golden. Um, I, I put a stiffener on it. Um, I use polyacrylic is something that I like to use as a stiffener. And it, it did like subtly impact like the surface. But then I, I was for this installation, I was trying to do these like rigid, like, kind of like the steel things in the other piece where I'm trying to have everything be like crisp, like these angles are, are trying to be 90 degrees, even though they're not, you know, so I, the whole thing ended up getting stiffened with polyacrylic, if that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's a creepy little face. Have you tried oh, like, using a like a cricket with your or like one of those like hobby style machines that cuts out fabric? Oh yeah. I was like, wait, what do you mean? Um no, that's hilarious. Have have you worked with No, those? I haven't tried it. I'm just I've been thinking about it because like my grandma has one and I keep and I cut out I make like very um, th things that are just really hard to sew around and then cut out and applique. And she's like, why don't you just cut it out with a Cricut? And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I think who's worked with those? I think that it's like actually like almost like a cookie cutter. It's a die, uh, D-I-E, I, not Y, but right. And it like just presses it in hardcore, like a blade. No, they, they have like blades and things. I mean, I think actually like that this would be, I, I actually feel like it would be fun to just experiment around with that, Leo, because I think it's, it actually speaks to some of the process points that Gabe is talking about where it's like just yeah. doing things through the copier and doing things. Like, I think that there's a lot of really, that, that's one thing, just an observation that I've really enjoyed about um, your presentation, Gabe, is that you don't just stop at the weaving, right? Like it's all about, it's, it's like, can this live in a photograph? Can this live in a video? Can this live in a, as a sound? Um, like, uh, and I think really sort of expanding sort of just what the actual um, original artifact is or the processes to intersect with all of these different things. And so, yeah, with the cricket, Leo, we can talk offline about that. But I think that even if it might not be the perfect tool, I think that there's going to be discoveries that you might make, right? Like with just playing around with it, right? For sure. Yeah, plastic and stuff like there's so I saw those recently looking at foils like I was teaching some stuff on like, you know, adhesing or adhering foils. Um, and I was like, there's something there and I haven't touched one yet. But yeah, you should definitely do it. Um, you can also like, I don't know, I, I think the trick would be like what will go through it and come out with something right on the other side. And I think like it might you might do something that's not expected, like try maybe plastic, and then you can like melt that on, you know, whether it's with a heat gun or an iron, depending on the plastic, use your ventilation. But I, yeah, I don't know what your aesthetic is, but aesthetic or, or plastic is so weird. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Yeah. What, what other things are people working on or is there, yeah, any technical things I'll, I'll definitely throw at you. You can see it's like semi falling up, like semi unraveling, but that's like these. Oh, and then I was hand cutting it too, because screw a laser cutter, like do, you know, like it's called scissors or a blade. Yeah. 
Actually, that's what Leo's working on right now. And in fact, because they haven't, we don't have the TC2 set up yet. Um, yeah. They, you know, they're trying to get their head around what they, what it is they're looking at. That's why they were asking you questions. But we were just talking about floats today. So I, I think they're able to kind of understand what they're seeing. But it's funny, Leo, because this is right up your alley, cutting. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I was curious. Um, I think I know what you're doing in the like void areas with the black, like mm -hmm. the warp coming through. Are you just like making that area on the file all black instead of applying a weave structure to it? Yep. I see. Yep. And actually, um, do you, I can't remember his last name. Isaac. Uh, he's part of like the TSA board, Textile Society of America. He, he's done some really cool stuff with like science collaborations and different labs, but he's done, oh my gosh, he did this thing called like three-dimensional digital jacquard or something. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, so you'll, you'll find it. Uh, yeah. Isaac. Is he at yeah. the, the Art Institute? I think I heard. I think, yeah, he works with them. I think yeah. he's in the actual Art Institute. Yeah. Um, definitely check that out later because it blew my mind. I was like, why didn't I know about this? It's like, it's just gorgeous. It's like, it's it's all the floats in actual negative space and then it's like expanded. It's just, it's so cool. Yeah, it's just, it's just a void. It's just black. Um, yeah, I was gonna say I should, it'll take like half a second, but I could see if I have my files. Here's some stuff. Okay, that, that would be great. Yeah, this is all just a bunch of stuff I haven't. So again, like, why not just, right? Like, I didn't weave this. Do I need to weave this? This is kind of cool. I actually, I have some stuff printed over there on this wall that I have no, and then I was doing, and then I did like some discharge, like I did a resist like Shibori style, like stitching and discharge. And I printed another structure on top of this. Like there's so much to do. So it, it's, this is in progress or whatever, but yeah, basically Leo, like I would just leave this 100% black or 100% white. And I might be able to find, let's see if I can find this specific one. What was that piece called? It's not this. We'll keep floating through here for a second. Decalibrated a reference. Yes. I love that name. I'll never remember it. All right, here are my files. This is process, twill, twill. I'm pretty lazy with stuff. I really just do twills over and over. Oh yeah, and then I printed it too and I was working with that. Well, let me find the weaving. It's this, no. I was also for this one, I was pausing the loom and then setting it back to like a certain thread and then weaving forward again. So there's, there's like a multiplication of eyes and things like that, you know, so if this is like 87 or, you know, pick 87, then I like wove up to like 92 and then jump back to 87 or something. Um, That's fascinating. Yeah. Tension we, we changes under. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say we had a question in the chat, but I just wanted, I don't know if you saw about the tension um, checker. Yeah, I was wondering how you work with tension change. Yeah, so that's why I was gonna unmute myself and be. I'm sorry. I just I feel like oh, I'm great. invading the space because I'm uh, from not from the school. So, but I was curious <laughs> about how. So when you're when you have those long areas of floats next to your areas of woven, it you're eventually the warp is going to be off tension and and how. Are you just manually dealing with that or like what, how, how are you managing that? Yeah, um, I'm hearing my computer starting to act like it because I tried to talk to a Photoshop file and now it's starting to sound like a rocket ship. So hopefully I won't disappear folks. <laughs> I can shut this down. So basically, yeah, that's the question. I was gonna say um, for everybody that's excited about floats and you know voids and stuff um here's all my stuff i don't know if it helps to quit stuff stick with me it's fine i want i do want to show you my files um if you want to stick around for it but yeah it's that's the whole point is like i on it 
and if you're interested in doing, um, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, if you're interested in doing this and nobody's been on the TC2 yet, like don't make, definitely like, I know this is frustrating and like annoying to hear. Don't make this, these your first files. And especially if it's a shared loom, like I've been doing this for, and you don't have to do it for 10 years to be able to do this, but yeah, you just pay attention to the tension. And I'll say this, the TC2 is annoying because it's trying to, it's faster than TC1, but it is trying to automate and, and like, it's, it's okay. It's the difference between getting on a computerized sewing machine and one that just does its job. I don't know if you all feel me on that, but like, I don't want any nonsense that's telling me like, I lifted up the needle for you. It's like, no, no, no. Like do the thing that you need to do. I don't want you to think about it. So the TC2 is trying to think about things and it's trying to self-correct with attention. So it takes a little bit extra babysitting than even the TC1 would. You definitely, I'll, I'll accommodate like weird tension things like this by like shoving in like a little bit of toilet paper by the beam here or there, dropping a weight somewhere. Um, it, it really is like, yeah, you gotta use the physical organic nature that we can offer. Um, and that that's like where we can come in. So I think this is a good example of my file. This is basically something that I wove. No, anyway, it might not matter too much, but you get the idea. It's got these dropped out spaces. You know how it is when you get to the end of a deadline and things are just everywhere. I have a file somewhere that I wove anyway. I can stop sharing this for now. And did I, uh, Nomi Kleinman, did I answer that question okay, I think? I hope. You did. Thank you. I think, um, sorry, I realize I have my split screen and I'm staring at the wrong one. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think the toilet paper and dropping weights, just like a regular floral loom makes a lot of sense. Exactly. Yeah, weaving knowledge. Like that's how I do all my installations. It's how I do the stuff on the on the water. Like I, I used to say this a long time ago. I've known it since day one. Like I couldn't do that stuff without being a weaver. And I'm not even I when the first time I saw a loom, I thought this is so stupid. Why would anybody do this? Like this this is so annoying and dumb. And then of course, like, you know, a couple thousand threads later, it's just I think all of us have been there. <laughs> So yeah, it's like embodied knowledge. It's just this tension thing that you feel. And I screw it up all the time with my installations, but thankfully I don't screw it up on the loom, which is interesting. I'll have to think about that. Okay. Any, any final questions or comments before we let Gabe get back to their evening. It is getting late there on the East Coast. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm like glowing by the light. Yeah. I'm getting eclipsed by myself. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good timing. You know, I'm, I'm, I know that some of these folks will be interested in the MFA program. Um, so I will send them a link and they can contact you about things. Um, yes. That'd be great. Yeah, please do. It's, you know, it's, it's a good program. Me and Robin are pretty cool. And um, our, our website might be a little funky to get around. So feel free to just reach out to me. Like they redesigned it recently and the click throughs kind of just take you back to the homepage sometime, I think so. But I shouldn't talk because I haven't touched my website since 2000 something. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, yeah, we will definitely, um, thank you so much, Gabe. We'll definitely be um, sharing this uh, talk on our um, PSU Textile Arts YouTube channel. And I will, um, uh, all the links that we shared in the chat and um, and also a link to the grad program, we'll make sure and, uh, and, and share that as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, but